Hi, I'm Dan Bartlett, Curator of Exhibits at the Elmhurst History Museum, and I wanted to welcome you to our latest exhibit, Eat Your Heart Out, Iconic Chicagoland Foods. Wanted to give you a little taste of what's in the exhibit. If you're unable to join us in person and an appetizer to hold you over until you can, if you are able to. We begin with the Chicago style hot dog that dragged through the garden delicacy that gives you an entire serving of vegetables. So the hot dog derives from the small um, sausages brought to this country by uh, immigrants, particularly from Germany and Austria. Uh, and these sausages were often sold on street corners, they were inexpensive. Um, but the hot dog itself is not technically a sausage. The hot dog is actually the combination of the sausage and the bun, which technically would make it a sandwich, I think. But, as we'll talk about a little bit later, um, we're voting on that here in the gallery to determine if the hot dog is indeed a sandwich. But regardless, the hot dog uh, itself, the sausage part, derives from the frankfurters and wieners that these German and Austrian immigrants brought to the United States. So we've got a sausage, and we've put that sausage on a bun. But why is it called a hot dog? Well, it's hard to tell what's in a sausage. And the dog part comes about because in denigrating the German and Austrian immigrants, many people assumed that these inexpensive sausages must contain inexpensive cuts of meat that might include dog. Um, some uh, wags from Yale along the late 19th century finally popularized the name hot dog in reference to the sausage on the bun, uh, and it spread across college campuses from there and on to baseball diamonds and across the country. Um, but nothing illustrates this kind of um, sketchy origin uh, and this kind of poking fun at the, the uh, German immigrant as much as um, one uh, verse from the song, Oh, Where Has My Little Dog Gone?, which we sing to our children today, but which began with a much different um, tone to it. It was written in 1864. And I will sing you the last verse. Now remember in this song, Oh, where, oh, where has my little dog gone? Oh, where, oh, where can he be? The singer is looking for their dog and lamenting the loss of their dog. But the final verse in the original 1864 version uh, sung with the kind of uh, uh, mock dialect that, uh, or accent that you would find German speaking goes, Un sausage is gut. Baloney, of course. Oh, where, oh, where can he be? They make some mit dog and they make some mit horse. I guess they make some mit he. Turned his dog into a sausage. And we've got a cute little uh, a video here from 1904 that Thomas Edison put together called uh, The Dog Factory, uh, in which that same joke is used visually uh, as um, these men take dogs and crank them in a machine and turn out sausages in the first part of the film and in the second part of the film take sausages off the wall, crank them in the machine and turn out dogs. Uh, so that then is the origin of the term hot dog. Um, but like the sausage itself, let's not think too much about what's in it or how it was named when we eat it. Let's just enjoy it. Now the immigrant origins of the hot dog, um, or the sausage at least that becomes the hot dog, is well illustrated by the story of um, Emil Reichel and Samuel Ladney, who uh, were from uh, Austria, and they had a recipe for some great Vienna sausages. And they sold these sausages at the World's Columbian Exposition in Chicago in 1893. Um, and they were so successful at the fair that afterwards they set up shop in Chicago and over the intervening um, 140 years uh, or more, that company has become the Vienna Beef Company, which is synonymous with the Chicago-style hot dog. So if you're having a Chicago-style hot dog, it needs to be, or should be, an all-beef uh, variety of the kind that, that Vienna Beef is famous for. Now, as for the toppings themselves, those also have uh, immigrant origins, or so the story goes, that as the hot dog moved across the city of Chicago, different ethnic groups added their own little touch um, to the toppings, which is how we end up with seven very unique 
toppings um, that make the hot dog uh, that we know today as the Chicago style hot dog. There are thousands of hot dog stands across the city of Chicago and Chicagoland, and these are typically holes in the wall um, where Chicago style hot dogs are um, kenneled, as it were, where you can go and buy them uh, and enjoy them. Now it's hard to think of Portillo's as a hot dog stand, but the um, hot dog and Italian beef empire that we know today actually started not far from the museum here in Villa Park um, in a very small trailer. A six foot by 12 foot hot dog stand that Dick Portillo opened, as I mentioned, in Villa Park in 1963. Um, There's an interesting quote uh, in his uh, biography where he says that it seemed as if you could find great hot dogs in every corner of the city of Chicago. Hot dog stands were few and far between in the suburbs. It didn't matter at that time that I didn't know a darn thing about hot dogs other than that I liked to eat them and thought we needed a hot dog stand in Villa Park. So the 1950s, the early 60s, through the 60s, this is a time when the suburbs are expanding across the city of Chicago and a lot of the, the kinds of foods that people moving from the city are used to eating are not yet available in the suburbs. And so um, Dick Portillo has identified the need for a hot dog stand in Villa Park. And sure enough, um, that inexpensive, tasty street food that was so, so successful in the city becomes successful in the suburbs as well. And across the, the decades, um, that original trailer turns into a larger trailer, which turns into one restaurant, which now turns into you know, dozens of restaurants across the Midwest. Now, speaking of Italian beef, that's another uh, immigrant working class food that's unique to the city of Chicago. And whether it was uh, meat packer Pat Scalia uh, or um, a, uh, an itinerant sandwich salesman named Anthony Ferrari who came up with the idea, the, the gist of the Italian beef was how to make a little bit of meat serve many, many mouths. Um, and so um, sometime across the early part of the 20th century, the idea was hit upon that you could take these cuts of meat, some of which were not the best cuts of meat, but they'd been simmered uh, and cooked for so long that they became much more tender slice them thinly, serve them on a bun with some of the lovely gravy um, put over the top of them, and the Italian beef sandwich is born. Now, as it was Italians that were selling these sandwiches, these beef sandwiches, um, they become Italian beef across the 1930s um, because they are so closely associated with the Italian neighborhoods of Chicago. So all of the foods we're talking about in the exhibit really have um, kind of a working class immigrant uh, origin story that's connected with them. Um, and the Italian beef, as I've, as I've just told you, is no different in its origin. Um, but one of the, the uh, well-known brands across Chicagoland, of course, is Bona Beef. And that has a very interesting um, working class uh, roots. And Joe and Peggy uh, Bona Volanto of nearby Berwyn, um, they had a great family recipe for Italian beef. Um, they had an idea for a customer experience and they wanted to create a business that their family could run, that they and their five children um, could all be a part of. And so the Bona Beef Company was born. Now, it begins in 1981 in Berwyn um, when they opened their first restaurant and they very quickly um, have to expand that business because it is so popular. So the idea was they didn't want just an Italian beef stand, a walk-up hole in the wall where these uh, sandwiches were traditionally sold. Um, instead, they were looking for a family-friendly place. You could bring the kids, it would be clean, you could sit down, you could eat. Um, and you can still do that at Bona restaurants today because there's 26 of them across the Chicagoland area. Um, Joe uh, Bonavolanto still comes into the office. Um, his five sons and now 15 grandkids are all involved in the business. Um, so it's kind of an American dream story, um, but again, linked back to that kind of working class roots, um, people with a good idea, um, a good recipe, um, creating uh, something really big, something that we like, a place we like to eat at um, with a food that we like to eat. And the recipe they're using is the same one that they were using in 1981, the same one the family was using since the early 1960s. By the way, 
Do you prefer your Italian beef to be dry, wet, or dipped, or in the lingo of Bona, baptized? Meaning, how much gravy do you want to have with the thing? Um, is the hot dog a sandwich? Is deep dish pizza really the best pizza? Should jardinera be hot or mild? All of these questions are important um, and also divisive topics when you talk to Chicago food lovers. Um, here in the gallery, we have an opportunity for visitors to actually vote on and help us decide uh, for once and for all uh, whether or not you can have ketchup on your hot dog. And we call it the food fight. You can pick up a ballot as you come in the gallery. You can uh, answer the, the nine questions. Um, and as on a weekly basis, we've been compiling the results and we'll occasionally post those online on our social media accounts uh, and also here in the gallery. Um, so it is uh, an important part of your civic responsibility to vote. Uh, and we hope you'll come out and help us figure out, um, you know, once and for all, whether or not the Italian beef, the Chicago deep dish pizza, or the uh, drag to the garden hot dog is the quintessential Chicago food. What goes good with Italian beef? Well, giardinera, of course. Now, giardinera is also another gift of the Italians. Uh, it is typically or traditionally made with um, celery, cauliflower, and carrots. Um, a lot of people add other vegetables as well. And it's traditionally made uh, with a little bit of vinegar. It's pickled a little bit, and it serves as part of an antipasto uh, platter. Now, in Chicago, we do things differently. Here in Chicago, we take our giardinera and we then um, uh, douse it in oil. So ours is kind of an oil based, and we use it as a, um, a condiment. And we have a number of different varieties of giardinera, um, some spicy, some not so spicy, uh, some sweet, some less sweet, uh, whatever your, uh, your palate desires. Um, the farther away you go from Chicago in grocery stores, you will find fewer and fewer options for giardinera. But Chicago is really ground zero for um, giardinera lovers. And we have a wall of 60 different varieties of giardinera from across Chicagoland. This is not in the least bit comprehensive, uh, but you get a sense of the, the uh, number of different brands that are made, the number of different recipes that are made. You can see that some include red pepper, some dice larger, some dice smaller. Um, but it is that love of giardinera is one of those things that is unique to Chicagoland food. So we just talked about giardinera, and one of the questions you can vote on is whether or not giardinera belongs on pizza. Now, as far as pizza goes, as you know, Chicago has its own very own style of pizza, the, the deep dish pizza. And here we are again, thanking the Italians. Um, the deep dish pizza that we eat today, or the more um, traditional, um, what we call tavern style, the thinner crust, often um, hand tossed, um, those bear little resemblance to the original pizza that was um, first kind of served in the Naples area of Italy, where it was a food for poor people. It was a, a thin bread crust topped with um, a few uh, vegetable kind of ingredients, and it was sold by the piece or by the slice, depending on how much of the food you could afford to buy. So Chicago, of course, took the pizza um, and made it better. Uh, the deep dish pizza, as you know, um, has a nice um, bready crust. It's actually made upside down with the cheese on the bottom and the sauce and toppings on top. Um, it takes a, a much longer time to prepare and to bake. Uh, it's really an event. Um, and some people will tell you that the, the deep dish pizza is only for the tourists. But our voting here in the food fight balloting that I mentioned before um, is showing pretty much a neck and neck tie uh, between what is the better pizza, whether tavern style or deep dish pizza um, is what we prefer in Chicagoland. So I suspect there's more than enough pizza love to go around and we can embrace both of them. Um, but the story of the deep dish pizza is as interesting as, as other parts of, of, of Chicago's food history. Um, the deep dish pizza is said to have first been served at Pizzeria uh, Uno in Chicago in the 1940s. And uh, about that time, um, an Italian immigrant uh, by the name of Adolfo um, Malnati was working for Pizzeria Uno and he was joined later by his son Lou Malnati. Um, in the 1950s. 
Now, as I mentioned before, across the 1950s, 60s, early 70s, a lot of people were moving to the suburbs, and just as Dick Portillo recognized the need for um, the hot dog stand in Villa Park, and the Bona Volantos uh, recognized the need for Italian beef in um, Berwyn, uh, Lou Malnati, who had worked with his father at Pizzeria Uno, um, decided to take deep dish pizza to the suburbs. Now, the restaurant opened in 1971 in Lincolnwood, uh, and Lou Malnati uh, always laughed that his uh, restaurant was an Italian restaurant that opened on St. Patrick's Day uh, in a Jewish neighborhood, and uh, that apparently um, always pleased him very much. And what the Malnati's found very quickly was that there was indeed uh, a demand for deep dish pizza um, in the suburbs, and the restaurant uh, in Lincolnwood soon grew to three restaurants. Um, Lou Malnati passed away in 1978, and his wife and sons uh, carried the business on until today there are now um, something like 75 restaurants across the Chicagoland area, uh, including one here in Elmhurst, which opened in the 1990s and continues to serve pizza um, just down the street from the museum. So let's have dessert. Let's go to the original Rainbow Cone in Chicago's Beverly neighborhood. And let's step back in time to 1926 when Joseph and Catherine uh, Sapp um, opened an ice cream shop at Western and 92nd, which at the time was right at the edge of the city of Chicago. Um, they had an idea for a five flavored ice cream cone, um, one flavor stacked atop another, and they were well positioned. To, uh, to sell these ice cream cones as being at the edge of town. They were also near um, some of the cemeteries, the big cemeteries. And on the weekends, as people came to um, visit the graves of their loved ones on the way back to the city, they might stop and have a rainbow cone. Um, and so here we are, you know, 96 years later, that original location um, at 92nd and Western is still there. You can still get a rainbow cone there today, still made with the same original five flavors. Um, and it wasn't until 1986 that you could actually have a rainbow cone anywhere else. And at that time, the third generation owner, um, Lynn Sapp of Rainbow Cone, started taking rainbow cones to the great taste of Chicago, um, eventually opening um, a, a place on Navy Pier where you can have a rainbow cone. Um, but this is a very unique confection um, for Chicago. And during the Great Depression, uh, it was actually sold as um, kind of a meal into itself, right? And it was a big serving size, it was a dairy product, it contained nuts and fruits, um, and it also was um, kind of a treat. And so even though Americans struggled during the Great Depression, Rainbow Cone was able to carry on uh, and, and supply um, uh, a good living for the Sapp family now through three generations. You will have noticed, if you've been around the suburbs now, that you can find Rainbow Cone in more places. So, for example, not far from the museum here in Lombard, a couple of years ago, a Rainbow Cone store opened. Uh, and Rainbow Cone has partnered with the Bona Beef Company and the Bona Volanto family to pair their uh, Rainbow Cone with Bona Beef restaurants, um, which is a really interesting um, and unique combination. You know, I mentioned that all of the, the stories that we're telling of these companies start with somebody with a good idea and a recipe and or a notion of the way they wanted people to enjoy their food. And over the decades have been able to steer their vision um, to the present day. So except in the case of Portillo's, which was only sold in 2014, um, each of these companies is still operated by the family that started it, they're still each shepherding their unique vision and recipe um, in the way that they imagined it when they began. And so it's natural for a family-owned company like Rainbow Cone with a very um, unique product that they're very, very proud of um, to partner with a company like Bona who is doing the exact same thing. Um, and Lynn Sapp of Rainbow Cone has said that that combination is very good for, for that very reason, is that they understand the need to keep that Rainbow Cone um, what it is that people remember from many, many decades back. So there are lots of other foods, or at least food brands, that are closely associated with the city of Chicago and Chicagoland. Way too many for us to spend a lot of time in real estate in the exhibit talking about, so we kind of compressed some of these down uh, and, and created this area in the gallery where there are some memorable sound bites 
that are related to these Chicago area companies. Companies like um, Brock's Candies, Armor Meats, Oscar Mayer, um, Jay's Potato Chips, and so on. So if you are of a certain age, um, you can come to the back of the gallery here and you can sing along with some of the greats. Armor hot dogs. What kind of kids eat armor hot dogs? So having talked about hot dogs, Italian beef, rainbow cones, and pizza, I am pretty sure I know where I'm gonna go for lunch this afternoon. But there are a lot of people across our community that are not certain where their next meal is coming from. Um, and so we've partnered for the exhibit for the month of July in particular um, with the, the Elmhurst Public Library and the Elmhurst Yorkfield Food Pantry to encourage people to bring food donations to the museum or to the library to drop off to help those people in our community who are struggling with food insecurity, who are not necessarily certain where their next meal is going to come from. We're collecting canned goods. Um, there are lists available of the types of materials that the food pantry is interested in. Um, but if you can't bring um, canned goods to the museum or the library, look up the uh, Elmhurst York Field uh, Food Pantry online, make a small cash donation. Every little bit helps. Um, but remember those in our community, as we learned during our Great Depression exhibit a couple years ago, uh, Elmhurst and DuPage County rise to the occasion to help those amongst us who have less than we do. Um, and we didn't want to talk about all these wonderful foods that we're familiar with across the city of Chicago without recognizing that some people um, amongst us are hungry. So thanks for everything you, anything that you can do. Um, we thank you very much. Well, thanks much for uh, coming and visiting us today, for dining with us today, um, as it were. Um, but I wanted to uh, recognize our sponsors for this exhibit and for all of our programming here at the Elmhurst History Museum because without um, these fine individuals and businesses, we wouldn't be able to do the things that we're able to do. So thank you very much.